Welcome everybody to the 39th limited edition of the Giornate del Cinema Muto Pordenone Silent Film Festival. Thank you for joining us. I'm really delighted to have presented this film, which um, is just so beautifully, not only beautifully made, but also beautifully transformed by an exceptional accompaniment. So I'd like to introduce this afternoon our guests. First, Mary Simonson, who's joining us from Colgate University, where she's the director of the Film and Media Studies Department. Welcome, Mary. You need to, uh, could, could you put your, um, unmute yourself? Thank you. <laughs> uh, thanks for having me. 
My pleasure. Uh, Kasper Tiberg from the University of Copenhagen. I'm here. Thank you, Jay. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Kasper. And John Sweeney joining us from London, who uh, accompanied the film this afternoon. Hello. <laughs> Hello, John. Um, I'm going to launch right in actually with you, Mary. I, who, you've studied uh, quite a number of the Saketo films, but you probably haven't had a chance very often to see the films with accompaniment. And uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts about how that transformed the film. Yeah, this was just fantastic. Um, I was so curious to see, I'm always curious to see with dance films how the dance scenes get handled um, and and then just how the drama gets handled. And um, I, I, th I thought the, the work that John did was really great in both um, characteristically sort of uh, conveying what was happening in those scenes in a really accurate way but then also getting us into and out of those scenes in beautiful, beautiful ways where, it, it, you know, you felt the end of the performance happen, um, but then you also felt the continuity of the film continue. Um, so, yeah, I, I thought it was really a fantastic accompaniment, John. Thanks so much for sharing that with us. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that was really marvelous. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, John, would you like to talk a bit about how you conceived the, the accompaniment? Uh, I mean, Mary's touched on, a, on an interesting point here. It, it, down, when you get dance and sonic film, it's, it is often quite tricky, um, both in terms of actually finding the music to fit with the dance, both in terms of character and rhythm, but also a, a, a question of how you get in and out of it, how you get out of, say, the diegetic situation, which is happening on stage, and then into the drama again. And that was something with this film, which I, I, I spent quite a lot of time working on. Um, to try and find a way. I mean, I find it. I find it fascinating with this film. Also, that you have this thing where you have um, her dance, which is very distinctive, and then you go to what I'm assuming is the Royal Danish Ballet School, going by the style of how they dance. The, the little kids are dancing. Um, you get this contrast of two things happening. Um, I'd, I'd be interested to know how, in, in terms of her dancing, her her, her actual work. I think, I think at that time, we know, for, as far as I'm concerned, I know very little about the dance apart from the sort of a ballet, there's a ballet russe, and then there's the traditional ballet companies working then. But in terms of work like hers, I've never seen something like this before. Yeah. Mary, would you like to address some of that? Sure. Um... Yeah, it, it, this is such an interesting time in dance history, I think, because, you know, ballet is still strong and is happening, um, you know, in, in Europe and throughout the U.S. Um, but this is also the moment when the ballet russe, as you said, comes in and really begins to sort of shake up what ballet might look like. And then it's a moment, and this is the tradition that I sort of situate Saketo in, um, this moment of early modern dance and female dancers um, like Isadora Duncan, you know, going out as soloist to perform. Um, and, you know, but I think, well, so, so let me back up and say Saketo um, was, you know, inspired after seeing Duncan dance in Munich. Um, and yeah, her, her mother was a pianist, a musician, her father was a painter, her brothers were painters, so it was an artistic family. Um, but she saw Duncan perform and decided that dance might be what she wanted to do. Um, and so she studied ballet, the traditional ballet at the Munich Court Theater um, and then debuted, but her dance style is really like not very balletic actually. Um, and is much more in line with something like Isadora Duncan might've done. Um, she captured the attention of Loie Fuller, who was another female early modern dancer um, who used you know scarves and lighting and was actually quite cinematic in what she did. Um, and and uh, Fuller took Saketo with her to the U.S. to perform some, um, and that's how she sort of came to be known a bit in the U.S., but she was also very active throughout, throughout Europe during her career. Um, and, you know, I think she's both a dancer, but we might more, you know, it, it, for our vocabularies, the, the term pantomimist might make more sense. Um, she was really very interested in uh, conveying narratives, conveying stories on some level. And then she was also most known for what were called Tanzbilder, uh, dance pictures, um, dance images. And so she was interested in thinking about using dance to interpret 
paintings um, using dance to interpret music compositions. She had this um, idea that, that artists weren't able to, or artists working in visual or musical arts weren't quite able to complete their work um, and that the body and pantomime was needed to create a complete work. And so she spent a lot of her career sort of um, looking at, at paintings, looking at music compositions, and then trying to sort of um, uh, create uh, a, a, a physical sort of manifestation of them or transform and complete them somehow in her in her dances. And so I think we see a bit of that here. Um, I have some ideas about what some of these dances were. I think many of them she performed on stage as well or were versions of that. But I think that's, that's the tradition we can think of her in is these early female early modern dancers, pantomime tradition, um, and then a little bit of the tableau vivant tradition too. I was really, um, if you go to eBay, for example, and you type in Rita Saketo, you'd be amazed at how many postcards there still are. There's a huge number of images of her in various outfits, exactly what you're describing, Mary. Um, tableau, uh, dressed in 18th century costume, the Pierrot, uh, in, in Poiré outfits as well. Mm -hmm. So her that, that presence and her, the popularity of her cards are still really, um, uh, you can feel them by just going onto something like eBay. And there's that wonderful scene in the film when um, the count goes to the counter and begins buying all of the cards. And it has such a kind of meta quality for me. I was thinking in a way of comparing it to Mistanguet's image where she's constantly playing, Mistanguet is always playing off of her own image or at least so often. In, in, in some of, in many of her French films, Mistanguet Detective and different things like that. So the idea of clearly playing the dancer, partly playing herself. And Casper, in this sense, I was wondering, is there anybody else in Danish cinema that you can think of that's doing this? I mean, how, the, first the idea of just a dancer, a, for, a foreign dancer uh, becoming a star in Denmark seems unusual, is that right? Yes, I mean it's it's um, that is a bit uh, a bit unusual. I think that that um, I mean there are several things here. Uh, I think that that the I mean I'm, I quite agree with your point about the meta quality of the postcards um, I, in the Nordisk collection at the Danish Film Institute. There is um, this sort of advertising poster come folder for Saketo. Um, where one side is sort of 16 small images of her in different roles. And I think that some of the images that appear there are the same images as you see in the postcards. So there, there is this, this, uh, this double level is, uh, is, is very clearly there. Um, and, uh, no, I, I think she's, she's a bit unusual, um, uh, both in terms of being, uh, um, uh, but but in terms of being a, uh, a dan dancer and 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 also a foreign star. But I mean, there were quite a few Swedes and Norwegians in in, in Danish film. Um, but um, uh, I think in some ways, um, I think that what Nordisk, in a sense, was trying to do there was to find a kind of substitute for Esther Nielsen, uh, uh, who notoriously broke her contract with them and went to Germany um, and had a big success there. And they were sort of, it seems, looking for sort of um, a female star that could do a number of different things. And I think that they tried that with Rita Saketo. They also tried it with Betty Nansen, who was a big star of the Danish stage, uh, but but not uh, not a dancer. Um, um, among sort of the uh, major figures of of the Danish uh, silent cinema, I think I mean, there's the actress Clara Pontopidan, um, who was I mean she's she's mainly known as an actress, but she did actually. Uh, um, train as a child um, in the Royal um, Royal Ballet School and she also before entering films uh, uh, she performed um, a barefoot dance um, on the Isadora Duncan model um, so she sort of had some notoriety 
uh, from that at the time that she became a movie star. And, and then just in terms of how Holger Madsen is using her as well, or just Holger Madsen in general, I mean, just the way that the film opens, I love how suddenly there's this crowd of people who are filling the, filling the frame in, in such a, a wonderful way that brings us directly in and that sense of, 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 uh, of the start of a, of a theatrical performance too. And um, I, I love you, you talk in your catalog note about his use of, of mirrors and, and, and um, curtains as well, which is so beautifully done here without feeling like it's too heavy handed. There's something quite no. uh, just pictorial, beautifully pictorial yeah, yeah. about it. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, Messen clearly had a, sen a, a strong visual sense. This is, um, this is one of his, I think, first films for uh, uh, Nordisk. He was, he was originally an actor um, and had played at various provincial stages uh, beginning in the mid 1890s, and then uh, uh, I think in 1908 he came to Copenhagen and became an actor there. And he was very celebrated as sort of a master of disguise, of makeup, uh, um, and um, famous for using makeup uh, um, to to um, uh, for for character parts. Um, so, so he was, he was in that sense, technically, uh, a very gifted, but he also, I mean, immediately sort of grasped, uh, um, the, the tableau style that was prevalent in the Danish cinema at the time and was also then, uh, worked together with, uh, a cinematographer named Marius Clausten. And I mean, I think that, that most, if not nearly all the i think 80 films that 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 uh, Harker Messen uh, made uh, during the teens were were shot by Clausen who was very interested in in using artificial light electric light uh, um to uh, to create uh, atmosphere uh, in the shots and 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 that um sort of combined with with um uh with the strong pictorial sense that 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 we also see in the way that he uses uh doorways and frames of various sorts and i i, I think that that as i as i wrote i think that this is it, it sort of um inserts this uh subtle suggestion of the stage of the theater even into uh, um sort of the living room sets um, and, and in that way sort of suggests the, the central conflict of the film, which is that uh, uh, our, our heroine has to, um, to abandon the stage. John, there's a wonderful scene after she's been told she has to give up dancing, and, but she's in her sitting room and then she just begins to do a little bit of a solo dance. Yeah. And it's really a, kind of a, just a magical moment. And I, I wondered if you could talk a bit about what musical choices you made for that um for that bit i mean that was kind of instinctive in a way i i i hadn't planned anything for that i i was i i mean i recorded the film i didn't record it in one take so it's not one performance but it is based on a few takes and and that bit i hadn't planned what i was going to do and it just felt like it came naturally and that's, uh, going on from what Gus has just been saying, I, I feel one thing which is a real gift of that film is how the use of the doorways of people coming in and out of doorways, like going into another scene. Like there's, I think just after that, there's the bit where she goes out of her room into the, and then she goes into that sort of vestibule area where her husband is about to go off to his club. And it's like there's a sort of, there's a continuity which is which is given to you, but also there's a sort of you know it's a new scene. It's all it's almost it, again it's very like almost stage like. This people are entering in in a in a new scene. Um, I don't know I, I don't know if I may, it's, it's kind of obvious. It sounds very simplistic, but it seems to happen a lot in that film. People going in and out of doorways, and then and the framing is so fantastic of, of how how the whole setup is framed. But, but but it is a gift in terms of musically that it gives you a way of getting from one scene to another in a smooth sort of way. But I don't know if that makes any sense at all, or if that's just me rambling meaninglessly, I'm not sure. 
No, no, no. I think it does make sense. To <laughs> no, yeah, sure, it sure. Work. I don't know, Casper, if you wanted to to say anything uh, about that. Um, uh, no, I, mean, I, I, I think I think I think uh, John is is um, is making a, a a good point there. I mean, I mean, the the it is clearly sort of a film about stage people by people who know the theater really well and is are sort of able to use that on on different levels um uh to 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 considerable comic effect also oh absolutely and and just what you're saying about knowing the theater well I'm, i was amused i noticed it much more this time than i had before that in the theater manager's office on the left is the famous poster from Madame Butterfly with a bust of Voltaire next to that. And then there's the post, the, the photograph of Eleonora Dulce as well on the right. Um, just, you know, sort of the touchstones perhaps of, of European culture at that moment. Yeah, I thought that was so striking in the, the theater uh, director's office. I hadn't paid much attention, but the framing of that um, is really, uh, it was really noticeable for some reason when I watched this time. And I think the other, you know, picking up on um, this idea of all the curtains and the mirrors, thinking about Staccato's dance, and again, I have no idea whether this was something um, that, that was done on purpose or not, but very often she would start performances on stage in a frame and then would step out of the frame. So the curtains would open, she'd be in a frame and then she would she would begin her dance. And so thinking about all of those moments where she's framed by doorways or framed by by sort of the, the, the heavy curtains on the doorways or even by a mirror frame, um, there's something that, that is reminiscent and I think would have been familiar to any fans of her who had seen her on the stage as well. Yeah, that sounds, uh, sounds oh. very likely. No, 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 I, I just wanted to agree. So it, that sounds <laughs> very, very likely, yes. Yeah. But apropos of her fans, Mary, I was wondering, in, of course, you know, in, in 1910, she's appearing on stage with Anna Pavlova. As you said, she was with Loie Fuller. Um, her, her name is, is prominent in, the, in all of the programs that you see at the time. And then she's in Denmark and she's, she's making films. Um, mm -hmm. How much of her career did she continue on stage in tandem with her film career? Yeah, I think um, throughout the, well, through the first half of the 1920s or so, um, she was teaching. She founded a school in Berlin first, and then she founded another school in Munich, and then a third school in Poland, I think in Krakow. Um, she, she married a Polish count. Um, and so she she danced, you know, all through that time and was also um, began choreographing for other people, um, but was making films, you know, throughout the teens as well. And then um, I put this at the end of my note, but she actually had an injury. She was she was shot in the foot. And that was the end of her dancing career in, in 1924. Uh, and then she continued teaching. Um, when she when she was shot and she stopped performing though she was 44 so she was quite well not not old she was not old but for a dancer that was quite a long career and i think by the end of of her career you know the the aesthetics of the time had just moved way past where she was and so she went from being sort of a, a popular sort of trendsetter of a dancer to someone who was seen as really pretty kitschy um and uh almost uh, inadvertently humorous. So it, it might have been a blessing in disguise that her career ended when it did. Mm, mm. Um, it, inadvertently humorous, uh, yeah. Um, the, the, the comic element in this film, which you talk about, Casper, very nicely in your note, is really quite present. Um, yeah. And, uh, is this something that Holger Madsen tended to, to, to want to put into his films or um, how often do you have that? Because you expect this to be a tragedy in a way, and it's not. Yeah, no. I mean, it's it's. I think it's it's rather unusual. I mean, uh, again, we. I mean, quite a quite a few films have have been lost, obviously, um, and and most of the Holger Messen films that survive are dramas, and 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 they tend not to be to be very funny at all uh, um, and and sort of um, um, but 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 I mean here here it, it there's there's sort of a very distinct sort of comic uh, aspect to to the whole thing and um, and I think possibly I mean sort of the the, the idea of the absurd duel 
may have been a, a, a sort of inspired by a duel that took place in Denmark in 1900, uh, uh, which gathered sort of a huge amount of media attention, uh, um, where an actor from the Royal Theatre uh, challenged a newspaper editor uh, um, to um, to a duel, and they 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 actually fought the duel with pistols, although in a fashion sort of designed to make it unlikely that they would hurt each other. Um, and so they they both had to serve two weeks in jail uh, because dueling was was obviously illegal. Um, but there was made they was made fun of to an extraordinary degree there were drawings and all kinds of stuff that that just mocked these uh silly duelists and so i think that 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 still 13 years later i think that there would be this idea that that the dueling would be something kind of silly and and absurd and i think that 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 the sort of um, the poison pills here certainly uh, uh, bring that across uh, quite quite effectively. I also find, I don't know if you feel the same way, the, the three of you, that because there's that comic element to it, when in the end, it's, it's, it's clearly an ending we don't like, we want her to continue dancing, we want her to be able to, to um, be herself, to be the person that she wants to be. But because of the comedy element, somehow we can accept it more than if it's some kind of big drama. We somehow feel she might actually go back to dancing anyway. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I have to say, when I was sent the film, I, I felt I felt quite cross about the whole last bit of it. Um, I, I really wanted it to go into a proper kind of meaty tragedy. I mean, even if it did have some kind of happy ending, it seemed too glib and too pat. But actually, as I was working on the film, I, I came to actually really like the comic ending and how it was set up. And it did slightly remind me um, the pharmacist un uncle, the comic relief all the way through the film. He did slightly remind me of the deaf person in Italian straw hat who resolves the plot in the end. Um, and and I, I, what, what I do wonder about is the sequel to this film, right? Because he clearly earlier on, the husband clearly earlier on of the film is going off to the club. He's clearly seems to have lost interest in her whether is his interest being revived by this whole drama or or, or, or what I, I it's it's a funny film in the sense that at the end of the very clearly happy ending we don't know where these characters are going after that yeah i'd like to think that she goes back to the stage and keeps dancing and his sort of like concerns have been completely put at ease um, mm. Such a he, the, the husband is such a goofy character too, right? I, I, just yeah, um, yeah the, he finds her on the stage. You know, he falls in love with her on the stage. He continues to like to go. He doesn't even recognize her when he sees her until she takes her mask off. You know, <laughs> she's in a costume that she was in his house dancing in. Um, yeah, I, I just uh, I'm struck by um, the comedy in it, which I didn't expect because all the American press about this film is as if it's this, this terrible melodrama. Um, but I think that so much of the comedy is the husband is just such a funny little guy. Um, and you know, I was struck by too so many of the films about dancers from this period um, have really risque backstage scenes, right? Um, the impresario, the lecherous, you know, guy after the young female dancers, or um, there, there is something really sort of um, uh, dark about the theater. And in this case, what's backstage are these children dancing and this, you know, theater director who's just too busy to, to you know, pay attention to anyone. So um, the husband's concern seems completely overblown, particularly given what's actually going on in this theater. Apropos of the American press, could you talk a little bit about the, the reception of the film and Saketo's film career in general outside of Denmark? Yeah, well, I can say about the U.S., and, and Casper probably knows more. Um, in the U.S., uh, this film barely got any press at all. Um, and I, but I think it, it you know, was seen in the U.S. Um, very few of uh, her other films made it to the U.S., I think three of her other films. Um, and there's very, very little press uh, about any of them, really. Um, uh, plot summaries and then, you know, sort of announcements. But given how she had been um, received in, in New York particularly, you would think that there would be a lot more. But I, I haven't seen much at all in American trade. Mm -hmm. 
uh, Trade Journal chapter. Casper, could you say something about the, the distribution practices? Uh, well, I mean, the, the films, um, um, I mean, most of Saketo's, of the films that Saketo made for Nordisk have been lost. Uh, um, the, the other one that survives complete is a film from 1917 called Vosorwan Eglemis, um, which is sort of remarkably Catholic, uh, um, and it ends up with her uh, um, becoming a nun, um, which is, you know, really odd uh, uh, in a Danish film because um, the Catholic presence in Denmark is quite minimal. Uh, um, so, so that seems to be very clearly a film that was sort of made for export. Um, and I think that 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 um, uh, certainly part of the project. Or sort of part of the idea of hiring someone like Saketo uh, uh, was sort of part of the international distribution strategy that that Nordisk generally pursued, and sort of their their efforts um, to sort of uh, particularly to 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 conquer the German market and 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 also the um, the other Central European countries um, where where Saketo would all obviously have been very well known and and sort of well placed to um to give uh, a high profile to um, uh, to the company's films i'm glad marco was just now uh, he put on the little clip of her in the piero costume which is uh, just a, a such a delightful um musical uh, dance number and mary i wonder if you could talk a little bit about the the use of, of the piero figure in modern dance particularly at this moment yeah, no, I think this was a really popular trope um, that many dancers were pointing to, both both in dance and then I think throughout theater, um, you know, it was it was popping up everywhere. Um, she, Saketo staged two different Piero dances. Um, one of them was a three-act performance uh, that she did with the Met Ballet, actually, while she was in New York. Um, and the score was by Mario Costa. Um, and it, it was a sort of full narrative uh, treatment of Piero. Um, and then the, she did a second piece that seems to have been much, much shorter that I think this one is based on called Piero and the Butterfly. Um, and uh, it was sto uh, scored by um, Stoy Stoyowski, uh, who was a pianist, um, wrote a lot of piano compositions. Um, he'd written a, pi a Piero and the Butterfly piano piece that she used for accompaniment. Um, and, uh, you know, it, she performed this version in the U.S. Um, and actually the, the photos um, that are, I think, the most popular in the U.S. or that have, you know, are, are still in the archives now, are many of them are from this performance with, with her, with the instrument and the, the butterfly flitting about. Um, but people felt, felt like this was just sort of a, a fun and um, the reviews uh, thought, that, thought that this dance was fun, it was easy, um, it didn't have, it had a much more tangible reference, I think, than a lot of her other dances, which were, you know, pointing to um, uh, Velasquez paintings or things like that. Yeah. John, you've played um, so many films that, that are, are set in uh, with a dance milieu from this time, and what Mary was saying before about maybe we should be talking about her more as a pantomimist, uh, in tandem with the idea of a dancer. And I'm wondering, as, as, as a musician, how you felt about her performance? Um, she, in a way, she was easy to have ideas for because her, she's very, in the, in, in the dancers through this film, she's, she's very clear in her intention and what is and what is going on. Um, and you aren't, you aren't particularly tied as opposed to, for example, with the kids dancing at the Danish ballet school, where you you've got to you're tied to a particular rhythm. To, with her dancing, because it is more like pantomime, um, you've got a, a lot of freedom in the sense of how you structure it and how you pace it. Um, but she's giving you a lot in terms of character. I mean, it it seems to be it's it's crucially about character. All her, all of her the stuff which is in the film. Hmm. Mm. Another question I have for you, actually, in terms of musical accompaniment, the, the scene when she and the counter on the boat, it, 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 
what you do with that scene is really quite, I found extraordinary because you have the sense of the water. It's obviously what you're doing with both hands, of course. Th you have the sense of the water, but also the sense of the emotion that's going on. Um, you meld the two of them, the, the movement of the boat, the movement of the water, but also something very tangible with the two characters as well. Well, you see, I find um, I find that the whole love affair until 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 we go to one year later, the whole love affair I find very very touching, um, and I find him very touching. I feel he is genuinely he may be besotted with an image of her, but he is genuinely besotted, and it, it's very subtly done. I think, particularly for a film from nineteen thirteen, it's quite, his acting of of his feelings for her are quite extraordinary and then we have this whole scene on the boat where she, he he asks her to marry her, her him him but only on the condition that she gives up the theater we are all we as an audience we're all going no 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 this is a really bad idea but she doesn't seem to feel that at all um i try to kind of as that title comes up about you have to give up the theater i try and have a kind of undercurrent of sort of unease in the music to that point but of course, at the same time, you can see from the image on screen now, she's not feeling that. Um, I mean, we know, you know, this is, this is a, a not uncommon situation, which both with with dancers, but also with fil with film style, film stars who married a rich man and gave up their career. Um, you know, that was not a completely uncommon thing, and and and. I, it, it's funny our reaction to it is so different from her reaction to the film. Then, of course, a year later, she's feeling more like what, what we thought. But this whole scene, I felt, is kind of a climax of this whole rather beautiful love affair, um, which for the first, I don't know how long it is, how far it is the film, first 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes into the film, work consists of. Casper, can you talk a little bit about, actually, the, the, I mean, just the, the, the his, his shooting the location work, I think, is really quite, is so beautiful in this, and, and how that fits into... Uh, other films, both that he did, but also that other people were doing in that moment. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, I've, I've, I've actually, I mean, the the big fountain that you see is 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 a fountain called Gefion Springvatten, which is easy to recognize. But I've not been able to figure out either where the boating scene or sort of the exterior of the theater that they that they use uh, um, has been has been shot I have been have been wondering uh, uh, a bit about that and and you you know you know they they did sort of um, I mean they shot mostly in um, in the studio but but um, in many of these films you have scenes that take place um, in the streets of um, of Copenhagen, and sometimes they would go a little further afield uh, uh, to find the right kind of um, of location, and and they were sort of very um, um, uh, they 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 thought quite a bit about what kind of effect particular um, buildings would have, um, so that that they would use buildings that that would seem sort of appropriately metropolitan um, if that was what was called for and of course that since since a lot of the Nordisk uh, films were sort of dramas that were supposed to be set in 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 great European cities uh, um, uh, that 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 comes up uh, quite a bit and and so there's there's sort of an effort to make Copenhagen seem as grand as possible, uh, um, and to sort of be able to to play um, uh, other other locations um, as well, um, and um, yeah. Um, but occasionally they would go off. They would, um, I mean, quite often they would go across the water to the south of Sweden, um, where there are um, sort of uh, a number of other uh, locations that that that. Differ from the ones that you can find in Denmark, uh, um, and and um, and and use that to to create variety. Mm. Um, one of the comments that we've just received um, is there more of a story behind the, the dual scene being missing and then found again? You mentioned this in your in your catalog note, Casper, and I wonder um, 
what uh, further background you might have or, or follow up? Well, I mean, it's, it's the, the print that we have here is one that was reconstructed in the 1950s. You can see that the intertitles are the sort of characteristic titles that the Danish Film Museum used at the time. Um, and they sort of, they did a new print from, uh, from the original negative, um, because Nordisk had deposited most of their negatives with the Danish Film Museum when it was set up in 1941. Um, and, uh, um, but in the cases where the negatives had flaws, then, then, you know, those obviously carried over into, into the prints that were made at that time. Um, and, and this is the case here that, that, um, uh, this, the dual scene was, was taken out and, and used in, uh, a compilation film made, uh, um, in, in 1936-37 to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the founding of Nordisk. Um, and, um, and, 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 and to do that, they would just, they just went to the negative and cut out the scene and, and then, uh, put it into, into the, the negative for the compilation film. So, um, I mean, we've, I mean, there are a couple of these compilation films where we've, we've found interesting stuff that um, sometimes it's the only bits that survive of the films. Uh, um, and in other cases, um, uh, it's possible to, to sort of reinsert it into the negative and, and um, um, make the story complete in, in, in that way. And, um, and that's what's, uh, what's happened here. So you can see that the in, the intertitle that precedes the duel is in a somewhat different typeface. You can see that it's 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 a modern electronic typeface uh, uh, rather than the um, the museum 1950s typeface used in 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 the rest of the film. So um, so this film has been has been scanned from um, from the print and then. Um, the um, the additional scene has been has been reinserted uh, uh, subsequently. I'm not familiar with the the compilation films that you're talking about from the 1930s, so I could be completely wrong here and tell me if I'm, I am. But um, is there any kind of significance to the fact that uh, a, a, an element of this film was used for the compilation and promoting the the history of Nordisk? Does that mean that Nordisk was giving value, shall we say, to, to this film that it was well known, or is that just by chance? Uh, I think I, I haven't actually seen the 1937 compilation film, uh, uh, but, but I mean, it, it, it is, um, I don't know. I mean, it seems that, that, that they, they took this out as, as a funny bit because um, sort of the most, I mean, uh, uh, it, it's 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 a scene from a Rita Sacchetto film without Rita Sacchetto in it, uh, um, and it seems like if you wanted to tell the story of this important dancer being hired by Nordisk and 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 appearing there, then you would then you would take a scene where she's actually in. So so I think I think this is probably more um, sort of. Um, um, something that's that that was regarded as 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 amusing um and 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 used for that reason but i'm not sure because i i haven't seen the the actual compilation um, um torben meyer's presence is is quite striking he's in it a lot um yeah. and of course he's a, a an actor that we know and love deeply from the films that he was making in the u.s in the 1930s and 40s he continued a career that lasted unbelievably even into i dream of genie when i saw that i was quite taken aback um could you, how popular was he at this time mm -hmm. in denmark and how uh, frequently does he turn up in roles that are this substantial not that often. I mean, he's he's usually. I think he's he's more. Um, he plays smaller roles. Uh, um, I mean, uh, uh, for instance, 
in the uh, um, in 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 the film, which was featured in the presentation of the Stumfin DK project that we saw before um, uh, Berlinstädter. Um, uh, the film featured there is from Piazza del Popolo, and uh, Tom Meyer is in that as well, um, but has a, a small role as sort of a, an Italian uh, villain, um, and and so he's he's you know he 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 usually appears in 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 in, in bit parts. This is um, this is one of of the bigger ones. Mary, I'd like to to get back to something you mentioned. Saketo's age at, at a certain point, and of course, when she made the first film that she made, if, I, if I'm remembering correctly, it was one year before this. Mm -hmm. um, so she's already 32, and here she's 33. Um, that is a surprise for her to launch a career at that stage in film. I mean, yeah, and I wonder, Casper, if you know any more about this than I do. What I know is that someone from Nordisk saw her performing when she was in Copenhagen or somewhere near there and um, uh, tried to get her to come and apparently paid her quite a bit. She was, she was earning a pretty high salary as I understand it. I, 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 I think so. I haven't, I haven't checked this, but um, my understanding is also that she was, she was w very well paid. She was, they, they, they did want uh, um, sort of um, a proper star that they could, used to sell movies and i mean when you look at sort of uh the printed materials from her films it's it's very much featuring her and sort of the great rita sacchetto and so on and so forth with with lots of pictures of her so so um so i think that they that they um and and i I mean, you can also see that that this film, for instance, was marketed as part of a series, mm -hmm. the same way that Esther Nielsen's films were sort of the Esther Nielsen series of 1912. Um, then this was the Rita Sacchetto series of 1913, um, or the second film of the 1913 Rita Sacchetto series. So uh, um, I think that 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 the sort of commercial thinking behind it was similar that they wanted uh, uh something that uh they could sort of uh pre-sell to exhibitors uh with monopoly rights um and and also sort of use as um to help push uh their their other films um um the way that 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 um uh, Esther Nielsen was was very successfully marketed by her German company. And I imagine Sliketo may have seen this as a as an interesting outlet, right? Thinking about her aesthetic and her sort of vision of art, you know, that the pantomime or the dance that she was doing would somehow complete or would inflect other art. Um, I can see, you know, cinema is a, a relatively new form. She encounters that she's worked with theater, she's worked with music. She's thinking about painting, um, and so here's here's just a new uh, new medium to explore. Um, and you know, the the film that I've written about the most of hers is um, the Ghost of the White Lady, um, which I won't try the Danish. Um, but there's there's again there she is you know posed in a um, a picture frame, and she sort of comes to life from the picture frame. And so I wonder to what extent she really understood, or maybe negotiated some with Nordisk that she could bring some of her own ideas and her own aesthetics into this new medium at a time when, you know, maybe they weren't quite working as well on the stage anymore. Yeah, I mean, I mean, even even in the third film, uh, uh, the one that I mentioned before, Vosor and Glimis, the one where she becomes a nun, mm -hmm. um, there is sort of a real, as it's a long time since I saw it, but, but as I recall, there is sort of a quite extensive scene where she does a tableau vivant show uh, um, at this um, manor house uh, uh, where she's living living for um, uh, after a dinner party they 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 do this in in um, in one of the large salons and and giving her sort of the chance to to do these sort of picture frame uh, poses that that um, that she was so celebrated for so even even where 
um, she's not sort of playing a performer. Um, I think that they they would try to, or maybe she would ins she would insist on. I don't know. I I haven't seen any documentation either way, but but it does seem that that they would uh, let her sort of do her. Uh, the thing that she was uh, famous for, even when the story doesn't call for it uh, as strongly as um, as it does in this one, where it's it's sort of very much uh, a part and parcel of the whole narrative. Well, there's another funny footnote in her biography um, that in 19, 1912, I think, 1911 or 1912, right before she started making films, she um, did a stage number that I've not found any information about, but it gets called a kinodrama. And um, the, the one sort of small review I found of it um, says something like, you know, she's trying to take the aesthetics of silent film and bring them on stage. And it was called um, The Sleepwalker. Uh, and I have no idea what it looked like. I have no idea how she was taking cinematic aesthetics and bringing them to stage. But, you know, I think even before Nordisk approached her, she may mm. have been interested in silent film, again, as a medium and what, what that might do to inflect or sort of reinvent her, her work. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really sorry, fascinating. fascinating. No, I, I, that's, that sounds really fascinating. I didn't know that. Uh, um, um, yeah, no, I mean, it would be, it would be really, really interesting to, um, to know what that was mm -hmm. like. Um, um, and uh, yeah, yeah, that, that, that sounds really interesting. Yeah, if I get yeah, I to it more, I'll let you know. <laughs> Please, I was just going to, to, to reinforce what Casper was saying. I just find that fascinating because we think of it as always the reverse. Um, and the whole, you know, the, the use of the Del Sarte technique is influencing silent film gesture and, and drama. And then to bring it back the other way is, is really extraordinary. Yeah. Who knows what it looked like? It could have been a disaster. We don't, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming, Mary, that um, that Saketo's Polish count husband was more um, uh, uh, happy for his wife to to continue her career than than the count in the film. I suppose so. And again, this is another sort of um, piece of her biography that I don't quite understand. I don't know how often they were living together. Eventually, she goes to Krakow and opens a school. I don't know if he was in Munich with her at some point. Um, or yeah, but but some of the some of the sense I get from just reading um, uh, bits of of her biography, and she was still touring quite a bit until 1924, and then seems to have you know sort of jumped between different places, and then she ends up in the 30s living in Italy again. Um, so yeah, so I don't know I don't know how what their relationship was like or how much he supported her, but presumably she she continued her career and mm. and was making money so. And, and, and Casper, another question for you, actually. Um, the, 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 the characterization that Meyer has in the film, we tend to associate that kind of comic figure and oftentimes with, with some uh, German films, actually. But it's my understanding, Meyer didn't, did he, he went from Denmark to the US, he didn't sort of go through Germany, is that correct? I, don't I think so, yeah, yeah. I think, I think he was, um, I mean, from Piazza del Popolo is 1925, um, and I think that he uh, quite soon after that uh, went to Hollywood. I think that he he was in. I think he's in in Man Who Laughs, isn't he? Uh, uh, the Paulini film. Um, I think that was one of his his first Hollywood films, and yeah. um, uh, so 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 mm, I. Don't think that he went via Germany. I think that he went straight straight to Hollywood. Right. Okay. Um, there's um, Thomas Christensen from the Danish Film uh, Institute has, by the way, uh, sent a comment. Thank you for a good discussion. So glad you enjoyed the film, and it sure helped that we found and inserted the duel. So yes, indeed. Thank you very much, Thomas. We're yes. <laughs> <laughs> We're nearing the one hour mark, so I'm going to, and we have one other, of course, screening this evening at 8.30, the Laurel or Hardy program. Um, yes, contact Casper, Tom, yes. Uh, just one thing, because 
in your introduction, when you were work, working along the Corso, you said that it sounded like uh, the Stumfin DK project hasn't yet digitized all Danish silent films. That's um, uh, um, it's it's a five year project and. Uh, um, and it's 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 only two years in, so uh, uh, there's still quite a bit to go before uh, um, before everything uh, gets gets digitized. So it's it's an ongoing process rather than a finished one. Um, but there's, I mean, I think there's uh, something like eighty films uh, available on the website right now. Um, so um, I would encourage anyone who wants to watch more Danish silent films uh, uh, to go and have a look. Thank you for that. Oh, sorry, John, please. Yeah, I've got a very quick question for Casper. Uh, when I look at the website, why do all, almost all Danish silent films look so stunning? The actual preservation quality of them is extraordinary. Um, is this because we're, we're more negatives, more, more of the original negatives saved in Denmark than, than in yeah. other countries? Because the, I mean, the quality is extraordinary. I mean, the the, 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 the the Nordisk company was by far the, the biggest company in Denmark uh, um, and they produced sort of the, the bulk of, of the total uh, Danish production and, and they still exist uh, um, and, and they kept quite a lot of their negatives. So, 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 um, so it does mean that um, quite a lot of, of the films we have uh, um, are, are either, I mean, we can go in some, in many cases, the negatives are still around, uh, um, or in other cases, we have prints that have been taken directly off the, the original negs. So, um, that, 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 uh, helps them look, look good. Definitely. And also the incredible photo collection, which every time yes. I go to the site, I'm absolutely stunned by the quality and the number of, of, of stills there are for every film. That's a, it's such a rarity. And the, the ease yeah. of access is something that I think every scholar and film programmer appreciates very, very much. I, I'm amused, Casper, though, because I, thank you for clarifying that about the, the digitization project. I thought you were going to take me for task for saying that Danish cinema was probably the best in the world at the time, or at least you're going to call me out on my hyper hyperbole. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, 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 I've thought about that, but I decided, uh, you know, um, we know better, but but I'll 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 let it stand. <laughs> um, Thomas has added a comment, by the way, that the compilation, the Nordisk compilation film, uh, will be online. And they found several central scenes that have been missing in many films. We have inserted pieces in Atlantis, Flugtin fra Sarayet, and more. This one is the most missed scene located yet. So that is good news that we'll be able to, to see this. And still 300 films on the way. Much to look forward to, says Thomas. Thank you very much, Thomas. We do indeed look forward to that. And we are deeply impressed with the work that you've been doing and will continue to do. Thank you very much for joining uh, this afternoon. John, terrific as always. Casper, thank you so much. Mary, thank you very, very much for the insights um, uh, and for the company. So see you hopefully this evening and um, and in person, we hope, next year in Portland. Oh, yes, yes. 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 So, <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful <laughs> festival, Jay. Yes. And every, every, everyone... Everyone there, you've you've done a terrific job yeah. uh, under very very difficult circumstances, and and we we really appreciate that. It's an amazing team. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. <laughs>